Okay, so. Uh, in quantum annealing. Topics in quantum annealing, that's right. So uh, I was in a superposition that didn't collapse for quite a while. I uh, couldn't decide what to talk about. And then I saw the abstract that Tamim su uh, submitted, and it, it clarified what I should talk about, at least for the first half. So the first half of this talk will be about less chaos. And then hopefully, with uh, time permitting, I'll talk about why only the end matters. So this is work uh, in two parts, in part one with uh, Anurag Mishra and Itai Han, who are both here, and uh, second part with Lorenzo Campos Venuti, who is not here but will be joining us on Thursday for the QEO review. Okay, so my favorite topic, errors, quantum annealing, and an adiabatic quantum computing. And uh, there are a, a bunch of different sources of, of errors out there. Control errors can be particularly severe. Uh, in our context, uh, they refer to faulty implementations of the desired Hamiltonian, particularly the, the final Hamiltonian. That's one type, which I'll talk about. Then non-adiabatic transitions has to do with uh, going too fast and getting a little too excited. And then the third type is bath-induced errors. Thermal excitations, decoherence, not in the energy eigenbasis, lamp shift, which Frank Willem referred to yesterday as the reorganization energy. So uh, in this talk, I will not focus on, on number three, but I, I will focus on one and two. And uh, I'm going to try to convince you that we can make these problems a little less severe. So the first one, control errors, uh, is precisely what we heard about from Tamim. So I want to revisit this, uh, and this part will be entirely experimental. OK, so here is the Hamiltonian that you already saw. Ising Hamiltonian, it has two parts. It has the good and the bad. The good is what we want to implement. The bad has uh, some Gaussian distributed errors with uh, standard deviation sig uh, eta. Now, uh, this bad part has been discussed by many people. Um, this is a very uh, incomplete list. Um, it's uh, sometimes called disorder chaos, J chaos, analog errors. And in, in every case, uh, if you check these references, these are quotes, uh, bad stuff happens. So question is, how bad are these control errors, these analog errors, or as I will refer to them from now on as, as J chaos errors, how bad are they? And can we do something about them? So to answer that, uh, we decided to, uh, we as, as Anurag and Anita and myself, uh, to run experiments. And uh, these experiments were done on our USC-based D-Wave 2X machine. Uh, it has uh, 1,098 active qubits. It has uh, up to 12, it's a 12 by 12 uh, unit cell uh, lattice. And so what, what we did was we generated 100 random chimera-based instances with zero local fields, and couplers uh, that are uh, in this range, plus minus one six, one fourth, one half. And then what we did was we added artificial Gaussian noise with zero mean and standard deviation eta. And now, mind you, this is on top of the known existing in intrinsic control errors, ICE, which are estimated for this device to have a standard deviation of 0 0.03 in units where the, the maximum coupler strength is 1. All right, so what happens when you do this, right? So we're going to add Gaussian noise to this set. That's, that's the experiment. And the Gaussian noise is parameterized by its standard deviation eta. So one way to look at that is to compare the ground state probability or the success probability without the added noise to with added noise, right? So here it's just the intrinsic noise, which I'm remind you again, 0 0.03, but this is adding no noise. This is adding noise with standard deviation 0 0.05. And what you're seeing is the correlation between success probabilities of the same instance repeated once without the added noise, once with the noise. So <clears throat> the fact that all these points fall below the diagonal tells you that the success probability here is lower than here. Moreover, it decreases as you make the problem size bigger, as we go from L 
is eight, eight by eight cells to 12 by 12 cells. So adding the noise makes success probability lower, no surprise. Here is the same experiment, but now we're comparing 0 0.05 to 0 0.1. The effect gets worse. 0 0.1 to 0 0.15, the effect gets way worse. Right? And to make the point, here we're comparing the 0 added noise to the 0 0.15 added noise, which was the strongest. And you can see that the ground state is almost never found when we add 0 0.15 noise compared to the case where we added no extra noise. So the problem is, is indeed bad, okay? It really destroys the machine's ability to find these ground states. Now, I said that this is due to J-chaos, so what, what is J-chaos? Is, is there evidence of J-chaos? I'm not gonna get into the theory of, of J-chaos, and I, I will use an extremely simple-minded measure to quantify the existence of J-chaos. J-chaos is essentially associated with the existence of, of large variations in the success probability across different runs. So to quantify this variation, let's compute the average ground state probability. Let's compute the standard deviation of these ground state success probabilities. And our J-chaos measure is simply the normalized standard deviation, oops, sigma over mu. Okay, so the normalized standard deviation is our measure of J chaos. And the bigger this quantity is, the more J chaos there is, the more spread there is. So the same exercise comparing no added noise to noise at 0 0.05, but now we're plotting the measure of J chaos. So it increases as we add more noise. It increases even more as we go from 0 0.05 to 0 0.1, right? So the uh, effect is more severe and even more as we go from 0 0.1 to 0 0.15. And again, to contrast the two extremes, no extra added noise to noise at 0 0.15. In this case, every single instance, and I should have said there are 100 instances per size here, so you're looking at 300 instances, every single instance is now more J chaotic by this measure at 0 0.15 added noise to relative to zero added noise. Okay, so there definitely is strong evidence of J chaos here. Is lower success probability actually correlated with J chaos? And the answer is yes. This is J chaos as a function of success probability for all 300 instances at zero added noise. And you see that the success probability is much lower as the J chaos measure is higher. Right? And at added noise, 0 0.1, the effect is even stronger. All right, so yes, J chaos exists and reduces the success probability. Okay, so, so far this is totally in line with uh, what we heard from Tamim. I think the, the effect is absolutely important, significant, and uh, uh, does have to be dealt with. So now the question is what we can do about it. So the, the approach we, we wanted to test was quantum annealing correction, which uh, some of you uh, are familiar with. Uh, I will review it very quickly. The idea of, of quantum annealing correction, it's, uh, it's a poor man's version of trying to implement quantum error correction uh, because we can only partly implement a, an error correcting code. So the code we're implementing is the classical repetition code. Uh, so essentially what we're doing is we uh, encode every qubit into let's say three. So here is the encoded Ising Hamiltonian with the logical operators defined as such. And then we add, we, do, we go beyond the, um, the repetition code, we add a penalty term. This is the quantum part of this construction. So the penalty term has the three data qubits coupled to an extra penalty qubit, and they're coupled ferromagnetically. Right, so this induces a, um, a penalty against these three flipping, because if one of them wants to flip, then it has to also flip uh, the, the extra penalty qubit. So we add this penalty term. We combine the encoded Hamiltonian with the penalty term. There's a, a coefficient here, alpha, which we call the problem scale. There is another coefficient here, gamma, which is the penalty strength. Uh, this um, is optimized for the results that I'll, I'll be showing you. And alpha, you can think of as one. So then, with this encoded Ising Hamiltonian, we run the quantum annealing experiment. 
We cannot encode the transit field Hamiltonian, Hx, which is why uh, I call this a poor man's version of doing quantum error correction. Ideally, we'd like to encode this as well, but we can't, at least not on the current generation of, of the D-wave machines. So we run quantum annealing with this construction, with this encoded Hamiltonian, and then at the end, we decode every one of these logical qubits by doing a majority vote on the three data qubits here. All right? So that's quantum annealing correction. Okay, so does it work? Does it help overcome the problem of, of J chaos? So this is the uh, most extreme example. This is at the largest size with the largest amount of noise. And this is the success probability for all 100 instances. So this is just uh, the, the index of each instance. And in this case, when we're looking, looking at the largest size where the problems are hardest and the noise is the highest, you see that without doing the quantum annealing correction, only three instances were solved ever out of 100. Every single other instance, every other, uh, was, was never even solved. With quantum annealing correction, every single instance is now solved. Okay, with a low success probability, but every instance is solved. Now let's look at it more systematically. So what I'm plotting here is the improvement ratio as, as a function of problem size and noise. And by the improvement ratio, what I mean is the fraction of instances where the success probability is higher with quantum annealing correction than without it. All right, so at one half, where the dotted line is, if we're above this line, then quantum annealing correction helps. It improves the success probability. Below it, it hurts. And so this is the fraction as a function of size for different levels of noise with J chaos increasing along this direction. And you see that for low levels of noise where the J chaos effect is, is weak, up to size seven, it doesn't help very much, and then it starts to help. And for very high levels of noise, quantum annealing correction helps from the very beginning. It always is better to do it than not to do it. Okay, so that's one measure. Another measure is what happens to the J chaos itself with quantum annealing correction. So now this is the fraction of instances where the J chaos measure is lower with QAC than without it. So we want this quantity to be large if quantum annealing correction is to help. And again, in, in direction of increasing J chaos, you see that for sufficiently large noise, quantum annealing correction always increases the number of instances where this ratio is lower. All right? So this is other additional evidence that doing quantum annealing correction actually reduces the effect of J chaos. But what we really want to look at is scaling of the time to solution, because that's what it's all about. So what happens without quantum annealing correction? Time to solution, this is just uh, here, it's the number of repetitions because we work at a fixed minimum annealing time of five microseconds on the D-Wave machine, on the USC-based D-Wave machine. So time to solution or number of repetitions as a function of problem size, this is a log scale, log lin, right? So <clears throat> this is sorted by the amount of added noise. And we see that at the highest noise level, this is eight as 0.15. In fact, we don't even get to sizes above um, nine because they're never solved, essentially. All right. Okay, that's without the quantum annealing correction. What happens when we do quantum annealing correction? Now you see that the effect is reduced, right? So all these slopes have come down. What's more, at the highest noise level, we always solve every instance, as, as I already showed you, right? And moreover, the effect of quantum annealing correction is more significant, it helps more as both the problem size grows and as the amount of J chaos grows. All right, so <clears throat> the conclusion here so far is that with this very simple idea of uh, the, uh, the, the simplest type of, of uh, quantum linear correction code, uh, we can already do something about J chaos. Okay, so that's part one. Now let's me, let me move on to part two. So part two has got nothing to do with part one. It is related somewhat to the talk that we heard earlier today by uh, Lucas Brady. 
So it is about quantum annealing and about quantum computing, really more about quantum annealing in the, in the sense that I'm going to talk about how to reduce errors in, in an open quantum system. And this, this work is purely theoretical so far. So again, to remind you, another type of error that occurs in, uh, in AQC or in quantum annealing is, is uh, diabetic excitations due to going too fast. Now, formally, we can quantify this effect using the, adi the adiabatic theorem. Um, let me present the version for closed systems first. All right, so the, uh, the adiabatic theorem uh, formulated for a Hamiltonian that depends only on a dimensionless time parameter s says that the distance between the actual state, which is the state you actually get, and the desired state, the instantaneous eigenstate of, of, the, of the Hamiltonian, the, the thing you want, that distance is upper bounded by some constant that depends on the gap divided by the total evolution time, TF, the final time. Right? Goes like 1 over TF. So if you want to make this error small, what are you going to do? Well, you instead of going fast, you can go slowly. Right? And that, obviously, is going to reduce this error. But the question is whether you can go, whether you can reduce the error more than just one over the total time. Or is that the best you can do? And the answer is you can do better. You can do better than one over t. So this was uh, shown actually already in, uh, um, in the 60s in a paper by Garrido and, and Sanchez, um, and then uh, improved somewhat in, uh, in this reference here. So consider the closed system case still. Let's say we have a Hamiltonian that depends, again, only on, on, a, uh, a on a single time parameter, S. And it satisfies some technical conditions. And the important thing, the interesting thing, is what happens at the boundaries. The first k derivatives of the Hamiltonian are assumed to vanish at both the beginning and the end. All right, so this is the technique that also Lucas referred to as, as boundary cancellation. So what we can prove is the following statement. Suppose there's some number greater than 1, and let this be the error between the actual state and the desired state. The theorem says that provided you make the total time greater than this quantity here, which involves the inverse gap cubed, and that number r and k, the number of derivatives that we set to 0. So notice how r and k get multiplied here. So if you make k bigger, then you just linearly increase the time. If this condition is satisfied, then the error can be sup suppressed like r to the negative k. Okay, So you can make the error go down like a power of k. All right? So every additional zero derivative makes the error go down by another power. So that means we can make the error arbitrarily small, the adiabatic error, provided that the, annealing, the evolution time satisfies this condition. So now I want to take this, and that's the new work, I want to take this out of the domain of closed systems to the domain of open systems. So how does it generalize? Right. There are two important questions we can ask. First of all, should we really still consider the ground state? Secondly, should we enforce this condition at both boundaries? Because in open systems, there's an arrow of time. OK, so to set this up, let's consider something fairly general, a Liouvillian, such as Elam Bladian, but it doesn't have to be Elam Bladian, that, like our Hamiltonian before, depends only on a dimensionless time parameter s. So such a Liouvillian will generate a time-dependent master equation. It does not have to be Markovian. All right, so now, instead of the uh, state psi of s, now we have the density matrix rho of s. That's what you get from the, the actual evolution. And this Liouvillian has a steady state. I'm going to call it sigma of s. And the steady state is defined as the state that is annihilated by the Liouvillian. It, the, the Liouvillian evolution is contractive, so it goes towards that steady state. That's what, what this gives if you plug it into this differential equation. So the steady state replaces the ground state. 
Uh, so now the what you want part is not a pure state, not the ground state. Rather, the thing you should naturally want in open system evolution is the steady state. Okay, and we're gonna look at the distance between those two, the what you get and what you want. So first, just let's switch to a dimensionless Liouvillian. So I'm gonna factor out some time scale, tau naught, because if you look at this equation, you see that the Liouvillian has units of inverse time. So now this L tilde is dimensionless. Okay, and now here's the boundary cancellation theorem for open systems. It says the following. Some technical assumptions that are fairly natural. Let's assume that the Liouvillian has K vanishing only end boundary conditions. We don't need the initial boundary condition anymore. If it has K vanishing end boundary conditions, uh, boundary derivatives, then the error between what you get and what you want is upper bounded by some constant divided by the evolution time to the power k plus one. Okay, so this means that we can make this error arbitrarily small, assuming that we Im implement this, enforce this end boundary condition and um, we evolve for you know, time tf. So if you look at this equation, you see that if, if only these constants ck were independent of k, then this would imply that at fixed evolution time, we could make the error arbitrarily small just by increasing the number of derivatives that vanish at the boundary, right? If only this were true. We'll get to that. Now I just want to present another way, completely equivalent of, of uh, stating this theorem. The equivalent way is this. If you make the evolution time greater than this quantity here, where epsilon is the error, now we're going to fix the error, right? So if the evolution time is greater than this, then the error is smaller than epsilon. So again, now, if the constants ck were independent of k, this would imply that at fixed error, we would get a k plus one root speed up relative to not implementing any vanishing boundary conditions, right? So if you plug in k equals zero here, this, is, this power is one. That, that's why I'm calling it a k plus one root speed up relative to not doing boundary cancellation. Okay, so, so this is the adiabatic open system version of the boundary cancellation result. Now there are two caveats. One is, if you look at this carefully, you see that I'm talking about controlling a Liouvillian, right? I'm asking you to set the boundary derivatives of a Liouvillian to zero. But that includes conditions on the bath, and that doesn't seem reasonable. I should not, have, I should not be able to control the bath. And secondly, these constants, they do depend on k. All right, so we have to address both of these things. So, <clears throat> There is a very fortunate circumstance where it turns out that insisting a condition on the Liouvillian actually is only equivalent to insisting on a condition on the Hamiltonian. And this is for the physically relevant setting of having a, a time-dependent Lim, Davis-Limblot type master equation, Markovian master equation. So this is the, the Limblot uh, master equation, uh, which I'm assuming uh, is everything here is time-dependent written in this particular form due to Davies, which is, which is the physical way of deriving the, the master equation. So th this is kind of the canonical form here. And the point is that the Limblot operators, they actually have a special form that relates them to the, the system Hamiltonian. So because of that, it turns out it suffices to just ask that the system Hamiltonian derivatives at the end boundary vanish. And as soon as this is satisfied, then automatically the Limblotian derivatives also vanish at the boundary. Okay, so we only need to control the system Hamiltonian at the end, this is the arrow of time, to get this error to be arbitrarily small. All right, so only Hamiltonian derivatives suffices, even in the open system case, and only at the end. So the second thing, I still have to tell you about is what about those constants, ck, because this right-hand side here could still grow arbitrarily with k. So to address that, uh, we, we, we have to uh, do that numerically. 
Um, so here is a simple example, a single qubit. So this is uh, just uh, uh, interpolating from sigma x transverse field to, to sigma z with some schedule theta sub k, which is chosen to satisfy the condition that I told you about, which is that its derivatives at the boundary go to zero, right? And so here you see k equals zero is the, the blue line, k equals four is this extreme line here. Uh, no zero derivatives, only the first derivative, second, and so on, right? So, and, and there's a, a very nice way to parameterize that in terms of some function. Um, but the point is we're imposing a schedule with derivatives uh, whose derivatives vanish at the boundary, more and more derivatives. All right, so that satisfies the conditions of the theorem. How well do we do? Let's couple this system to this one qubit to an ohmic bath uh, via sigma y, um, insert typical flux qubit parameters, and solve this problem numerically, and this is uh, thanks to simulations by Tamim. So here is the log of the error as a function of the log of the total evolution time. And so what happens is that at short evolution times, the error is large, but then it starts to drop, as you'd expect from the adiabatic theorem. And what's very pretty is that as you increase the number of zero, deriv uh, zero derivatives at the boundary, the slope drops. And what's even nicer is that the slope drops to within plus or minus 0 0.03. It's exactly negative k plus 1, which is the prediction of, of the theorem, if these constants were actually independent of k. All right, so they, it turns out that these constants have a mild dependence on k. OK, so with that, let me conclude. I um, told you about two topics. The first is how to reduce J-chaos. And I showed you that quantum annealing correction in its simplest incarnation works in this context, at least up to the sizes that we were able to check. Um, it actually improves the scaling relative to the uncorrected case. Um, we don't currently have a theoretical understanding of why it works. And that's an open problem. So if anybody has any ideas and wants to talk about it, I'd be very happy to do that. Um, I strongly believe that we can improve this further by using higher distance codes, such as the nested version of quantum annealing correction and possibly others. So that's a, a little bit of good news after Tamim's Debbie Downer on, uh, uh, on JKS. Of course, I'm not claiming that uh, this is a scalable solution. It's just, it fits in the context of uh, solving problems within a fixed up to a fixed size. And the second thing I told you about is boundary cancellation. Right, so this allows us to get arbitrarily close to the steady state at a fixed annealing time, or you can reduce uh, the required annealing time at a fixed error. What I love about this technique is that it's, it's really simple. Right? I mean, you, you don't need any extra qubits. You need super duper control at the end of the annealing schedule. Provided you can implement that, then this result seems to hold. It even exhibits some robustness to uh, control errors. So it turns out you can even get away with imperfectly implementing the vanishing derivatives uh, at the end. And if you want to see the details, uh, check out our paper. And that's it. Thanks. Questions? Hey, Daniel, great. Uh, yeah, I'm feeling much better now. The, um, That's what that was for. <laughs> can you go back to the slide just before this one? Yeah, so I, I think for the longest time, I don't know if I fully understood what this implies, but I feel like I'm starting to get it. The, is it, like when I'm thinking about the annealing parameter S and the point, I'm imagining that there's a point along there where the dynamics of the qubits have actually frozen out and the system basically can't uh, equilibrate anymore. And now I'm actually kind of thinking that that's, that is this final point. But this final point where you need these derivatives to collapse is the point where 
the system no longer equilibrates because that, that makes a lot of, so for instance, like if you take it to a point where the dynamics collapses and you've got like a really like large energy barrier that's preventing any equilibration, then there's no point in more slowly raising the barrier any higher than that. Okay, so equilibration happens once this phenomenon starts to happen. All right, so this is as a function of annealing t uh, the total time, not as a function of uh, along the anneal. Right, so here you see that the error st actually is increasing. All right, so the, these TFs, these total uh, annealing times here are too, are too short. This is not the adiabatic regime uh, or not the equilibration regime. It starts to equilibrate once this happens. And then once it's equilibrated, then it turns out that these zero derivatives at the boundary make things better and better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Jet lagged. Yeah, well, I came in on Sunday. To keep the trip Thanks, Daniel. That was a really nice talk. Um, you mentioned that you consider your current error encoding a poor man's version of quantum error correction. Um, so, what can you comment on the types of controls you would want to evolve toward a slightly richer man's version of, of quantum error yeah. correction? that goes maybe beyond just a simple replica coding? Well, I mean, that's, uh, that's a Pandora's box if you, if you actually want to implement it, right? But um, what you need for this, for this code, you would need to be able to encode the transverse field, which would be a many-body X operator. So that's just not going to happen. Uh, so, so this is just not the right code for scaling up. Um, when, in order to scale up, we have to do things like implement um, subsystem codes like the big and short code. Um, those codes have uh, two-body gauge generators, which we can use as penalties. And um, they, under the right conditions, there's nice work by uh, Eleanor and a collaborator, um, and work by, by Milan Marvian and myself on how to uh, find subsystem codes that um, uh, have relatively low locality operators, and that, that's the main, the main trick here, is to keep the locality of the encoded operators sufficiently low. And it can actually be done with two and four body operators. Um, I don't think we need more than four body in general. So if you can implement a four body X, 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 and also Z, Z, sorry, Z, 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 uh, then, then you're in business. And we stop in business.